Uh, we'll get started here. So we have a longtime friend of both the con and of all of us here that's graciously agreed to get this event kicked off and started in the most appropriate way. We've got Simple Nomad here uh, talking about the enemy within, so please welcome him to the TourCon stage. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, this is not my first uh, tour con. This is not my first uh, tour con as a keynote. Um, I was uh, here at, uh, I think the first time I attended was at uh, uh, tour con two. Uh, and that was kind of weird because uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, David's mom running the show for as near as I could tell. It was kind of funny, you know, he's, I, I mean, he talks about being 17. He looked 12, okay? It was really bizarre, just like, wait, you're the guy running this conference? This is nuts. But anyway, so the talk today is called uh, The Enemy Within. And uh, I'm not going to specify at every moment what the enemy actually is. I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you guys to do. Uh, anyway, uh, like I said, I've been here a number of uh, conferences. Uh, I, you know what was weird? I think my favorite, one of my favorite ones I did was uh, uh, probably uh, TourCon 3. I keynoted at that. And um, uh, on September 7th, 2001, I flew out of Logan Airport to head home after uh, a week of uh, meetings, and the following Tuesday uh, was September 11th, and right after that was TourCon. And it was kind of a weird thing because, you know, I for, for four days they had, you know, all air traffic was set, shut down, and uh, uh, it created quite a... Uh, quite a scenario to be able to, you know, just just even getting on the plane. You know, everyone thought I was nuts for getting on a plane. Of course, I was thinking, that's got to be the safest thing to do right now is fly because they already did that thing with the planes. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I was worried I wasn't even going to be able to get out here at all uh, because I didn't know how long flights are going to be down. But I did get out here, and it was about a week or so after uh, they started uh, flying again when uh, they had TourCon 3. So that was a really weird, uh, really weird uh, conference to attend. Um, some of you probably know me as Mark, and that's fine. I, I don't hide behind my hacker handle anymore because uh, at the time when I originally started doing this, you know, I was basically afraid of large corporations and the government. And large corporations in the government know all about me now, so I, I do, you know, I do go by my real name at uh, times. Um, my current employer, I work at uh, Duo Security as a researcher. Uh, we're the uh, multi-factor authentication vendor that doesn't suck. That's about, uh, there's my sales pitch for you. And in a couple of weeks or so, I'm going to become a Cisco employee since Cisco is in the process of purchasing duo lock stock and barrel and that should be fun I'm actually looking forward to it um, I do want to cover because it's kind of relative to the discussion places that I've uh, worked previously probably the most uh, uh, interesting one there is I mean I have worked for very large corporations but uh, uh, probably the most interesting one uh, would be the one on the end there mitre uh, they only have I don't know if you're they, they do more than that list of CVEs, by the way. They're, they do a whole lot of stuff, but uh, uh, they only have one customer, and that's the U.S. government. And I don't know how I ended up with the security clearance. It makes no sense to me. I've been investigated by two different agencies at least three different times that I'm aware of. Uh, the last time, and it's been quite a while since I did this, but the last time I tried the Freedom of Information Act, my own FBI file, it was turned down for, I forget the, whatever the generic reason was, it was just like, you know, for national security purposes or something like that, they weren't going to give me my own file. Uh, but what that means is that they have an open case on you. So, you know, that was, I was like, oh, that's great. But somehow I got a security clearance in... Uh, 
probably because of, and this is just a few of the examples of why I was under investigation at those times. If there's any representatives from these fine companies, uh, sorry, you know. But it happened a long time ago, seven to ten years ago, at least, depending upon your, you know, jurisdiction. So, but uh, nonetheless, you sort of secured your shit. Sorry. All right. What I'm going to talk to today is about us living on the edge of society, okay? And I think I'm pretty much talking to everyone in the room when I'm talking about this. There's a lot of you here go back and forth between uh, black hat and white hat and and in between, and it's really not a matter of uh, hat color anymore, really. It's just uh, kind of a, a way of thinking, kind of wandering around through society. Now there's Picture this as being society, okay? And this is a hopefully a diagram that everyone can wrap their heads around where society's in the middle and it's moving in some direction at, uh, at all times and everything. And uh, there's probably some normals here in the room, but uh, probably not a lot. Uh, if you need some examples of normals, I think there's another conference or something going on just down the by the bathrooms, and I've already heard overheard conversations, and they're they're kind of flipped out that we're here, and that's 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 typical. That's 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 fine. That's fine. We'll deal with it. Um, now, see, because we're not quite in the middle where all the normals stay. We're a little bit further out, but because that's in the direction of where the edge is, of course, those normals are just going to think that we're the crazies. And, of course, there's the whole thing with the crazies, because the crazies are always looking in, and they're seeing the normals, and they're just saying, God, those people are crazy, all right? So it's kind of the exact uh, uh, same uh, uh, thinking. The problem is, is this isn't actually a very, uh, very good uh, diagram that illustrates the true nature of this edge out there where, say, the crazies live. It's a little little more uh, fluid, a little more, you know, nasty out there at times. You know, there's things that happen out there on the edges that create ripples that get in sometimes to the normals, and we're going to cover some of those ripples that have come in. And where does that leave us for the, you know, and I'd say most of us in this room. I mean, there's, I'm sure there's a, uh, probably a few crazies. I can, I can tell they're the ones that are shaking their heads going, no, I don't know what he's talking about. Um, and there may actually even be some normals who are thinking, boy, I sure came to the wrong place. But uh, most of us in this room, we, we're kind of in between. And a lot of us are able to wander back and forth between the normal world and the crazy world, and that's kind of uh, that kind of works to our advantage, right? We're able to kind of move back and forth. It's not uh, that's kind of uh, becomes second nature to us. That kind of uh, switching of the hats. <sighs> anyway, to kind of move forward and illustrate some of these things, I'm going to cover three things. I'm going to talk a little bit about the past. Uh, course I'll cover the present and I got to get into that scary future thing uh, so basically some way to kind of you know illustrate this whole uh, enemy within thing that I'm talking about um, now in the past there were things there were events that happened and these are kind of those ripples at the edge in some cases where the normals found out about it and they're just like oh holy shit this is bad um, uh, 20 years ago, back when DEFCON, or DEFCON, TourCon was first starting, DEFCON had been around for a while, uh, you had the rise of uh, DDoS. Now, uh, I don't think I need to explain to anyone in the room here with the gray hair, but uh, just uh, for the rest of you, there was a time back in the day when Amazon only sold books isn't that weird? They only sold books. And there would be these denial of service against attacks against these places. And uh, 
uh, against, uh, including Amazon, and you couldn't buy a book for like an hour, okay? It made national news. People were going crazy, and all the, all of us uh, hacker types that were around at the time, a lot of us got, uh, you know, uh, interviewed about it, and uh, they were talking. Says, so, you know, and I I remember I had one reporter that said to me specifically, said, uh, you know, all these uh, denial of service attacks that are going on. He goes, can you put it into perspective for my readers? And I was like, okay, well. Um, there are people starving in foreign countries. Uh, there are people that are being repressed by their governments. There's injustices right and left. And I can't buy a book on Amazon for an hour. Fuck me and my stupid book. Now, uh, not surprisingly, oh, yeah. Not surprisingly, they didn't use that quote. So. But nonetheless, you just had this event, and there's another thing that was actually interesting about this event, and that was that it was a really good example of an amplification uh, style of attack where you had an individual who could actually do something and influence, I mean, an individual with you know, seemingly easy to obtain skills be able to influence things at a large scale level, okay? Before it required, you know, armies and stuff like that. And, uh, but, uh, and, but now you just got this, this person is able to, you know, flex their muscle and, and do something like that. So that was kind of, a, that was kind of an interesting one. Uh, the weaponization of cyber. Now, I'm, I'm really not gonna apologize for using the word cyber. Uh, simply because when I worked at MITRE, that was because you had this whole group of people that, like, you know, generals and stuff, that their job was to make smoking holes, you know, and so you're having conversations with these types of people and this type of mentality. Cyber was a really good shorthand for making that conversation go a little bit quicker and putting them on the right part of the map. Uh, so that they kind of understood. I mean, marketing people got a hold of it and went nuts with it, and then, then the rest of us that were, had been using it looked stupid, and that was a shame. But, and I get that. That's fine. But you know, words are words, whatever. But uh, using the, the just referring to it as the weaponization of cyber, and that's is originally where we report things on bug track. Uh, back then, we were uh, we come up with a proof of concept. And even if that proof of concept only worked uh, one in four times, it was still considered, uh, you know, that was, uh, okay, well, that's, that's a, you know, a viable thing. However, you weaponize it where you make it to where it works every time, and there is no, like, glitch or anything. It just works clean and no, and no one notices. You know, maybe whatever program you are trying to launch, it goes ahead and launches, uh, and, uh, and everything looks normal to the end user. That's what I'm talking about as far as weaponization goes. That became a valuable commodity. You had people that are writing uh, these bugs, and we can, you know, whatever on the whole, you know, you know those uh, bug bounty program things. Uh, this is besides that. There, I have friend. I, there's one guy in particular is a friend of mine that he operates a bug broker business. And all he does is take weaponized vulnerabilities turned into f weapons and then sells, helps set up sales between these, uh, uh, you know, between the people that write the stuff and the people that uh, are going to use it for whatever purpose. As you can imagine, the U.S. government is a, uh, uh, a good customer of his and as well as... Uh, other various organizations, um, and the guy is making a mint. He really is. He is doing very, very well for himself. And you can pass whatever judgment you want on that, but it's the guy's making money. And even though I might say that's a terrible, terrible thing to do, there is a part of me that's jealous that I didn't think of it first, okay? I can't help but think that. It's like, wow, he can retire at age younger than I, so. Uh, but that's, that's the thing that's actually occurred, you know, in the, in, the, in the recent past. 
And the other one is that's really kind of influencing how things are heading now is the death of the perimeter. Um, I had my questions about the perimeter 20 years ago and in presentations probably from this stage, so to speak, at, at TourCon uh, in the early aughts, I uh, said that uh, I had originally was saying that the uh, perimeter wasn't dead, it just smelled funny, but uh, no, it was at least by 15 years ago, it was dead. Now, I mean, part of it was because we were punching holes in it to allow certain types of traffic through. You had to because you couldn't just operate in an uh, offline scenario and be a part of that whole e-commerce thing. So what really killed the perimeter? That's kind of uh, an obvious one. Obviously, you know, everyone got laptops. Uh, I know that it might, where I work now and most of the places where you work if you're issued a computer, it's a laptop, it's not a desktop system because they don't want you hauling your desktop system to and from work, you know, and they do want you to work at home or whatever. And a lot of us travel. Uh, Wi-Fi, which as we all know is the, the, the single most horrid thing ever invented on the planet. Wi-Fi, that thing's terrible. That's just causing nothing but problems for all of us. And then of course, uh, smartphones. That was the other thing that helped really kill the perimeter. People started bringing these things to work. They knew what the work Wi-Fi password was. They'd go ahead and you know just get them on the corporate network. They don't care. They want to be able to get to their data wherever it is. So essentially what it was was mobility that killed the perimeter. And that's kind of the reality of where we are today. Now, where we're kind of heading, and this is also kind of where we are in, in a way, so this is kind of present and in, in, in near future. Um, infrastructure changes uh, are continuing to occur, and by that I'm referring to the main the main one we're seeing is the cloud. And uh, what's funny about that is, again, if you know what a punch card is, then you probably remember mainframes, and you probably remember. Uh, you know, there's a few people that are nodding their head and having PTSD reactions to that. Uh, uh, Back then, mainframes, they had mainframes, they had time sharing and dumb terminals, and if you wanted to use those mainframes, you were having to pay for your storage and your access and all that other kind of stuff. Sure, things shifted as we got stronger out on the uh, edge of the networks with the, uh, with the uh, desktop systems, and we started using servers and, as, as opposed to mainframes, because we had these powerful machines and now everything is kind of going back the way it was with the cloud infrastructure where you're paying for storage and uh, bandwidth and uh, computing power just like you did way back in the day. Same economic model, it's just scaled a lot better, okay? Uh, but we, you know, we've got that now. Um, smart cars. Now, I would bet, and I'm not going to do this, I would bet if I said, raise your hand if you think you're a good driver, 90% of you would raise your hand, and statistically, 40% of you are lying, okay? Because, and this is, I, I, I don't know if this is a uniquely American thing, but you're just taught that you're the best at whatever it is you're doing. I am willing to admit, and my wife will back me up on this, that I am a shitty driver, Okay, I really am. I'm a bad driver. That guy you're honking at, that's me because I'm doing something stupid that you don't like. Um, I want a smart car. This is going to be a thing that's going to be good for me. I want if they say, oh, because I live in the Dallas area. And if they say, oh, we need you in the uh, Austin office tomorrow for meetings. It would be nice to be able to say, okay, fine. I set my alarm for 5 a.m. I get up, I go lie down in the back seat of my car and say, drive to Austin, and I'm going to sleep in the back seat and let my car drive me there and just tell the car to wake me up when we get to Round Rock so I can stop at a Starbucks and try to be awake for the first meeting. That's, you know, that's what I want. That's how I see the future heading. I want that. We can't have flying cars, so I'll accept, uh, I'll accept this instead. I get more work done and you know, or sleep more or whatever. But uh, this is kind of, and we're, we're kind of getting there, people. We really are. Uh, 
you got to kind of ignore, I mean, yeah, sure, there's going to be some people that get killed because shit doesn't work on occasion. That always happens at the beginning of every everything. So, But uh, eventually we'll, we'll all be riding around in smart cars and stuff. And, of course, smart homes. Uh, and this is the one that's kind of the funniest for me is because, you know, I just you know, used to say, you know, 20 years ago you talked to people at a security conference and say, hey, a company wants to sell a device that listens to every word going on in your house just in case you call attention to it to do something stupid like turn on the lights or play a, play a song you want played. And now we get mad when it doesn't work right because we're put this, you know, it was essentially a bugging device in our house. I know, I got three of them, okay? You know, and <laughs> that's, what it, that's what it's doing, you know? It's just funny. That we're, but this is how things are kind of heading, and it'd be kind of, you know, all these things are going to start talking to each other. I'm getting to a point with how, where I'm heading with this. Um, you all probably have Bluetooth scanners on your phone and scan stuff, right? Some of you do, anyway. Just look to see what's in the world around you. If you look closely, it's kind of small, but in the, uh, upper uh, left-hand corner there, I'm in airplane mode because I'm on an airplane. And uh, yeah, it's the usual cast of characters, a lot of Apple watches, and the Apple stuff's really uh, uh, kind of out there in the Bluetooth world. And there's a few devices down there. I think the One and the Surge at the bottom, those are some type of fitness trackers and whatnot. But the top one, the top one, that's the one that really got my attention. Callie's hearing aids. What in the hell is that? All right. So naturally, I connect to Callie's hearing aids <laughs> to poke around and explore. They have the same security that you have with uh, headphones. So I could have very easily, Callie, this is God. Give the guy in 24D all your money, you know, or <laughs> whatever. I mean, just, you know, that's, this thing's nuts. And so I started looking, and I did a little bit of, you know, poking around into this. And talk about a nice little glimpse of the future. This is, uh, this is kind of, there's a couple of com companies that have gone out of business. I can't remember if ReSound, who's the uh, people that make, uh, made Cali stuff, um, a couple of com companies have already gone out of business. There's been small companies that have been making these uh, hearing aid type things. They're called hearables, okay? Because that's a cool and fancy term. Instead of wearables, these are hearables. Now, what they do is not only they function as hearing aids, a little later, I didn't get a capture of it, I should have, uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, Callie's uh, iPad appeared on the Bluetooth scanner and Callie started watching a movie without getting out headphones. That's because her hearing aids were paired to her iPad and she was sitting there watching a movie or something on there. I know, because she's in the same row as I am on the other side of the aisle. And I'm just fascinated by this. And you know, after you know, landing and kind of doing some exploring, there's, you know, there's a couple of companies that have been doing this kind of thing. Uh, they had all kinds of features that they were wanting to put into these hearables. And have you ever been to the doctor and they stick that thing in your ear to take your temperature? You know why they do that there? Because there's veins in there that are real close to the surface and they can get a really accurate reading of what your temperature is. You put in these hearables in each ear and you could do really cool things with it. Not only get like someone's temperature, you can get, uh, you know, and heart rate and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can get oxygen level. Uh, you can do a full EKG of a person. If someone has a heart murmur, it can detect that kind of stuff. That's the kind of technology that they're working on. Like I said, these two companies, the, the main proponents that were doing this, they had both gone under uh, because they were small companies and they were having issues with things like you know battery power. They couldn't get these things to last more than five hours uh, and whatnot. But the thing is, this is the direction that this thing is kind of uh, heading. Both of these companies, one of them had a working version of this actually, 
uh, the, the hearable, it could hear something in a foreign language and do translation into English into your ear. Now that's fucking babblefish from Hitchhiker's Guide shit right there, okay? That's, that's wicked cool. That's really neat. And so you start thinking about that and just like, well, okay, well, the companies went under, but there are three companies that are working on this stuff now, including one of them who's bought a company that does the translation stuff with this in mind, and those three companies are Apple, Google, and Amazon. So this thing is coming. I don't know if that's all public knowledge. Oh, never mind. It's just some three large companies. But nonetheless, I mean, this. I think it is public knowledge, actually. But this is kind of the direction that's heading, and you can see the problem that they're facing, and that is they need massive computing power right there in the ear, okay? And... Uh, because they've got either they're going to have to use that massive computing power to facilitate communication with the uh, uh, with the uh, router that we apparently all carry. Um, here's my router. Here, Apple makes uh, my router. I don't know about you, but that's essentially what this thing is. It's a router for all your devices and stuff for your little personal, you know, pseudo cloud that you walk around with constantly. Uh, but that, yeah. So that's how things are. Are heading. So we're getting into kind of this futurish area. And I want to talk about a few things else that's going to kind of influence this to a certain degree. I probably should check my time. I did decent on time considering. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, this is, this is kind of a problem that I have. Because I, I mentioned the, uh, you know, the quote from, uh, you know, on the Amazon book thing that they didn't use. Uh, and I'm not talking, when I say bad journalism, I'm not talking about, you know, yelling fake news and all that other kind of uh, bullshit that's related to politics and, and stuff. No, I'm talking specifically things that affect our industry where you've got these clickbait things where they focus on the worst possible scenario. This seeps into your consciousness and begins to affect your ability to do proper risk assessment. Uh, whether you want it to or not. But in many cases, it's because you're trying to uh, appease someone that's one, two, three, four levels higher than you that's uh, at your company that's saying, hey, are we vulnerable to this thing I read about in People magazine, you know, or whatever the hell they read it, you know, because it made it into mainstream or something. They start flipping out about this kind of stuff. And this, this, is, a, this, is, this has done nothing but get worse. Nothing but get worse. A, a quick example of this: um, there was a, I, there were some article. I've seen articles on this where they talk, and they, a whole industry has popped up from this, by the way, of RFI, RFID protection devices. All right. In spite of the fact that to get a credit card and to get through those layers of encryption into that chip, you're going to need, well, one, you're going to need a lot of computing power, and you're probably going to need some of that, you know, weaponized cyber zero-day shit that we, you know, I was talking about earlier. That's going to be some pretty clever shit. This is not something to where someone's going to walk up behind you with a Proxmark 3 and hold it up to your butt or to your purse or to your wallet or whatever, and, and all of a sudden they have your credit card. No one in this room, unless they were involved in playing with this stuff back at the beginning before credit cards had this kind of stuff and had decent encryption have had their credit cards absconded with this it's so much easier just to walk up and like you know hit them over the head and take the damn credit card you know because we don't do a chip and pin in this country we just do chip not like they do in europe so, I mean, it's just kind of, uh, there, there's, so, you know, looking at that RFID stuff, you know, and I've looked at it and I've tested it, okay? There's people that are making a fortune selling these sleeves and stuff to help protect you from bad guys in this one scenario that is, is not going to happen. And so, it just, it just becomes a, a ridiculous thing. Particularly, and I did a test on this at, for a duo and actually put out a video on it. It's uh, If you search for duo RFID and one of my names, you'll probably find it. But uh, uh, I ended up, uh, you could do the same thing with a Chipotle wrapper, for God's sake. Now, it, 
it's just as good, just as good, all right? It meets government standards. By the way, there is a government standard for testing RFID blocking technology, and I'm not kidding. Um, now, yeah, there are some dangers like, uh, I don't know, is anyone staying in the hotel here? You get one of those nice cards that's to, you know, to, to scan to get into your room. That's, you know, uh, those kinds of things. Those can be probably duplicated with a, someone with a Proxmark 3. But uh, uh, I believe someone's doing a talk tomorrow on hotel stuff. Maybe they'll cover that kind of thing there. Um, this is going to be a problem. It's, it's a problem now, and it's going to continue with overreactive legislation. And I want to touch on the concept of cyber insurance. Have you heard about cyber insurance? I see a few people nodding their head with sad looks on their faces. This is, this is horrid, okay? This is absolutely horrid in many ways. And do, I just want to just, because of the things I've talked about, you know, clickbait headlines that influence people like, uh, okay, remember um, when the loft testified before Congress and they go up there and you read the transcript and it's all this stuff that they're talking about and it's just all detailed and it's like, wow, they're really representing. What were the headlines out of that? We can take the internet down in 30 minutes. That's it. That's what they reported. That's what made it into the press. We can take the internet down in 30 minutes. They left out all the other stuff because that's the clickbait uh, headline that, the, that all the major things are going. And so that's the kind of things that's gonna drive these legislative decisions. And you're gonna have cyber insurance, uh, you know, these lobbyists are gonna be influencing this thing. Think about what the insurance companies have done to affect things like uh, your uh, homeowner's insurance and particularly your car insurance. It is illegal to drive without car insurance. That's heavy shit, man, if they're looking at cyber, right? Damn. So anyway, on to happier things. Um, IoT, now this is, I, there, I think a, th a quarter to a third of the talks here at the con are on IoT in some form or fashion. This thing is gonna continue to evolve and it's going to become a launch platform for other targets. Think about and think about it in terms like this, as far as instead of getting specific about a particular target, think about it like this: there are devices out there, like like the hearing aid thing, the 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 hearables, okay, where you need to have massive computing power out there, uh, somewhere that's going to be doing. Okay, it's let's say you have a camera device out there and it's taking pictures and it's got to transmit all this video data back to the cloud and then stuff's going to be churned on it and it's going to make a decision based on that data which is you know ultimately probably a yes or a no you know it's okay so if this thing is only periodically on the network it makes sense to why not push down some computing power to allow it to go ahead and make that yes or no decision there on the edge out there in the middle of some field or some you know monitoring thing that it's doing and then shove the yes or no answer back up to the cloud. Much more efficient, okay? That complicates things when you start thinking about you know DDoS, ransomware, depending upon what these things do or just altering the data that's on them. I'm not talking about DDoS against these devices, or these, or I am talking about DDoS against these devices. I'm not talking about using these devices in a DDoS attack. If they're only on the network every once in a while, it doesn't make any sense. But depending upon what these things do, that could be fairly serious, you know? I mean, if they're, you know, monitoring a water supply or something like that, and they got you know an automated boat that goes around and picks up data from sensors because they're only online every once in a while. Being able to affect that kind of output, that that's that's interesting. Uh, the other one is not only uh, that deals with I IoT is that IoT is becoming IIoT, industrial Internet of Things, and really it's all just becoming I. Okay, this shit was going to be everywhere in everything. 
And that's just the way it is. is you know, you, you, when you bought a television, you know, when I was a, a little kid back when, you know, everything ran on coal, you know, in, including the internet, uh, you know, television was like, you know, three feet by four feet by four feet, you know, just this, this massive giant box that uh, had to sit on the floor because it was so big, if you wanted a big screen. And then they came out with flat screen TVs and they differentiated between them by saying these are flat screen TVs. Now they're just TVs, okay? And uh, yeah, these are, these are now, they're not smartphones anymore, they're just phones. Which, you know, most of us don't actually have voice conversations on them. It's all electronic stuff and everything. And that's just kind of the way it is. And I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's stupid where you have like, you know, there's, you know, smart toasters and smart this or that. But, you know, eventually, you know, you're not going to be able to buy a toaster that isn't capable of printing weather reports on your toast in the morning. Okay. You know, you're not going to be able to do that. The toasters, those will just become toasters, and the old ones will become uh, antiques. But, uh, yeah, security issues are not going to help uh, this whole situation at all. Now, there are things that do help. Multi-factor authentication, patching, only allowing trusted users and devices only to access company assets. These are things we all know. Without You have to do it without a perimeter, so that whole... Uh, a zero trust networking thing that for some reason is now the rage with marketing. Uh, uh, but by the way, it does work. I mean, stuff does work. Uh, and, uh, you know, for the most part, I mean, there's, we're, we're getting there with it. But the main point of this, with this stuff, you know, beginning to come into fruition, is that I really think that uh, multi-factor authentication is going to kill the password. The password is the single most laughable security thing that we've come up with as an industry. It was originally meant to tell the difference in a time-sharing system between Alice and Bob so that Alice couldn't get on there and print things off in Bob's name and it gets billed to Bob's department because Alice's department was out of credits. So to protect the accounts, they put on passwords. There have been countless, countless presentations at security conferences talking about passwords and, you know, how to break them, how to get a hold of them, all this stuff. That's the prized possession, passwords. Uh, we're already at the point, how many people here use something like, you know, LastPass or, you know, OnePass or whatever it is? You just, yeah, li yeah, and you have it generate this massive password. You don't even know what that thing is. You know, if someone held a gun to your head, you're not going to be able to answer them and tell them, no, I don't know what the password is. Because this big thing generated and it stored it for me. I, don't e I didn't even look at it when it was generated. You know, that we're already at the point where we don't even know our own passwords, okay? So if you can do this whole thing with a combination of, you know, you know, a, 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 you know, a push authorization and a biometric there's your two-factor right there. You're meeting the standards, and you're not using a password. Password's going to die soon, okay? And, I mean, it's weird, too, because, I mean, I work at a company whose whole premise is built on the fact that passwords suck. <laughs> you know, I work for a company that does that second factor, and that's weird. We even have a few customers who I can't name that in certain cases, they don't even use the first factor. They just use the second factor for authentication. So that's where we're heading. All right, we're going to start getting stranger here. The merging of human and machine. We're already a part of this. All of us are. You don't even probably think about it. But right now, a lot of you probably have your phone in your pocket. And when your phone buzzes, a lot of times you can tell by the type of buzz that it gives you whether you got a missed phone call, a, uh, a notification of some type. You can tell the difference between them, okay? I've certainly gotten used to this, you know, this Apple Watch, you know, and I can, I can identify about, th you know, three or four different types of, uh, you know, with the haptic feedback sensor. 
You know, you can get shirts. Now, there's none that have come around that uh, everyday consumers are typically buying yet, but you can get shirts that have haptic feedback sensors put in there. They're mainly intended right now for athletes, you know, so to make sure that when they're working out, they're, they're you know, really exercising properly. It's giving them immediate feedback to make sure that their muscles are being exercised properly and whatnot. That stuff, imagine taking something like that and then having that on and tying in your alerts and things about your environment into that shirt and you're walking around and you're able to, you know, interact in a completely and uniquely different way. I mean, you can get simple and just say, you know, a tap on this shoulder means one thing, a tap on this shoulder means another, you know, a slide up your spine means a system you manage has been compromised. I mean, you can get creative with it. But, you know, nonetheless, I mean, this, this kind of stuff is, is there. But we're heading that direction, okay? And this is a kind of a big one for me, and that is that there is no difference between the real world and the digital world. Not anymore. There used to be, and you can deny it all you want, but we have become... There's like this melding of our online personas and our real persona. Uh, one influences the other. Sure, we can try to present a different face online, but I can't think of how many times I've had to present a different face in real life at like say Thanksgiving dinner, something like that. Same thing, we're just doing, it's just the same thing. There is uh, no difference whatsoever. Um, all right, now think about this as a template. I remember talking about this thing as kind of like an example of uh, you know, Callie's hearing aids. Uh, let's try and apply this to something else that doesn't exist yet, but that could. And this will get this will be kind of a stretch, but I just want you to hear me out, okay? I want you to think about a smart gun, all right? Now, your first thing is you're going to have military application of this. Because I don't know about you, but, you know, after, you know, playing things like, you know, Call of Duty, Fortnite, Halo especially the ones that take place in the future, like some of the versions of Call of Duty and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Halo. Why does the weapon, why isn't it tied biometrically to the guy so that, you know, if he drops it, then his enemy can't pick it up? And you know what I mean? It just makes sense that if you tied it biometrically to a person, then it would, uh, you know, keep, uh, keep someone else from using the gun. You know, you could eliminate gun safes because the only person that could pull it out of the gun safe is that person that's biometrically linked to it. You know, that might, I know that there's people that are on both sides of this uh, whole gun debate, but that kind of answers a lot of the issues for both sides to some degree. Now, don't start shouting out, but what about, you know, then you, some edge case. I don't give a shit. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about using this as an example. Okay, there is... Uh, and you can apply this to, you know, all kinds of different things. I'm just using a, a, a gun as an example. But it was, you know, the military, I would think, would develop this first because they're the ones where, you know, they don't want the, you know, the military has some great new weapon. And, you know, and we're, you know, the military is going in and doing some, you know, really massive invasion. They don't want an enemy to pick up their brand new cool killer weapon and then use it against them. That would be wrong. That would kind of, you know, that would be a bad thing for them. And it makes sense, you know, just they lock it into the thing in the carrier while they're on their way to fight their fight. And biometrically, it's only that one soldier that can pull that thing back out of there after it's charged up and whatnot. And it's also providing all kinds of interesting thing like, you know, various pieces of uh, telemetry and, you know, performance and all, all these other kinds of things can get fed back to headquarters or to even the manufacturer just to let them know that, you know, something needs to be fixed or repaired or, you know, or whatnot. Needs a firmware update or, you know, automatically post pictures to Instagram, whatever the hell they add to these things, I don't know. You know, and, and just so you know, I mean, just, and just to kind of give you a little bit of why I picked guns is because I have a, this weird fascination with them. Uh, you know, I grew up around them all the time because uh, I grew up in, uh, in Oklahoma 
And my high school, in a suburban area, my high school, they had people that drove to school that had gun racks in the back window of their pickup trucks with guns in them. And it was not a big deal. A friend of mine actually had one in a bag and had gone into the school with it and got caught. And the vice principal came out and says, now you know the rules. We're going to walk right back out. And I don't care if you're going out to so-and-so's ranch after work or after school. We're going to walk out there to that parking lot. You're going to lock that gun in that trunk where it needs to be. And that's what happened. And the news wasn't involved. It was a different time. And I mean, just, you know, this is just the way things were. And I was around it all the time. I s never purchased a gun and still don't own one. And mainly it's out of paranoia because I keep thinking at some point I'm going to get busted. Uh, did we lose the screen over there? Or has it just not been on? Oh, okay. Well, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've never had a gun because I thought, well, if the feds come in and they bust me, they're going to get me not only for hacking, but they're also, if they find a gun, they're going to say uh, uh, possession of a firearm during commission of a felony and then have a 20-year charge. Now, they're not going to take that to trial, okay? They'll be part of the plea agreement where they've, they've tacked on, and I'm being dead serious on this, folks, okay, where they've tacked on, you know, 15, 20 charges and then... They say, well, okay, well, we'll take, we'll take away all but three, okay, including this gun charge, so you're not going to be in jail for 20 years. You know, that's a real thing. And the last time I heard about this being used, you remember Tommy Chong was selling Chong's bongs? You know, one of the first things they did when they raided his place, they were looking for a gun so they could tack on that, uh, that, uh, that crime onto there because that way they can get him to go ahead and uh, take the uh, the agreement. Now you can go ahead and, by the way, if you're going to go ahead and fight that kind of stuff, uh, feel free you know, to go ahead and try and fight the government. They have a uh, about a 95% conviction rate. Just something to keep in mind. Anyway, enough about that happy stuff. I want you to consider a few things, and these are things that have to do with uh, doing risk assessment. All right? Now, everyone in this room has probably done risk assessment at some, some point. And this is where we get into the real kind of enemy that exists. Um, I would imagine that there's some people that I'm not going to have you put up hands because I might immediately end up embarrassing you inadvertently, and I don't want to do that. But uh, I'd imagine a lot of you have taken steps in your lives to make sure that you're not murdered, Okay. I'm just, I'm just going to guess, all right? You don't have to raise your hands if you're preparing not to be murdered. Uh, but the thing is, is that statistically, you are more likely to commit suicide than you are to be murdered. So are you actively trying to make sure you don't commit suicide more because that's more likely? When you're thinking about your own mortality and you're making assessments on, you know, how you might die, when you do things like saying, well, I'm not going to take that airplane because terrorists flew it into a building or, or whatever, or, you know, you're going to get in your car where you've got a, you know, 65 times greater chance of, you know, being injured or whatever it is, whatever the exact number is. I mean, that's the thing. The number one killer in this country is heart disease. How many people are actually actively trying to prevent themselves from dying of a freaking heart attack versus some other type? Well, a few, a few brave souls are raising their hands. <laughs> Most of them have grayer hair like myself, but, uh, you know, something you young'uns should probably pay attention to. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I mean, these are the the things we're not we're we're assessing the wrong the wrong things half the time. This affects your thinking when you start thinking about when you're being inundated with things like bad headlines. You're being, uh, you know, all these examples of uh, and and then cultural norms. And that's the thing we've. You know, we've walked back and forth between those crazies and the normals. We can take a little bit of different perspective on this and get a little bit better sense 
of what actually could happen versus what other people tell us are going to happen. So, I mean, kind of, um, you know, in, in, in closing on this, I just want you to think about that. Just when you're doing that risk assessment thing, we've got one other thing, like when we're, when we're talking about, you know, having these things pushed out to the edge and they've got this massive computing power that are, that are on there, you know, the camera looking at the, you know, water supply or whatever. Those types of things, we have to take into account uh, where they fit in the, in the really big picture within our society. 80% of us in the United States live in an uh, uh, urban or suburban environment. Very few live outside of that. So if shit happens, uh, you know, some type of cyber disruption happens or there's even just even natural disasters to a degree as well. But, you know, where there's no power or no whatever, uh, just for even for short periods, it's extraordinarily disruptive. And so as we're pushing this technology out, we have to kind of keep that kind of thinking in mind. All right. So anyway, that's pretty much the end of my uh, talk proper. Um, I was going to take time for questions. I know that they're running behind. I can give them 10 minutes back. Uh, so really, if you've got questions or anything, just uh, you can reach me at these uh, couple of email addresses. I'm Simple Nomad on Twitter. Uh, and also you can, uh, there'll probably be, a, I'm hoping at some point, the gnome at cisco.com added to that as well. But, uh, and I'm going to be, I'm, unfortunately due to my scheduling, I'm not going to be able to be here uh, tomorrow. But I will be here for the remainder of the day uh, and ar hanging around the conference. So if you got any questions or comments or anything you want to talk, hit me up. Anyway, it's great coming back here and doing a keynote. I love this conference. It's always a lot of fun. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.